Hello everyone, I'm very excited to welcome back Dr. Charles Brenner to the channel. So Dr. Brenner is the world's expert on NAD metabolism and its roles in health. In 2004, he discovered the nicotinamide riboside pathway to NAD and has over 150 publications to his name. But importantly, he takes a highly critical scientific view of the biomedical research and emphasizes thorough methodology. So welcome back, Dr. Brenner. It's my pleasure to be with you, Dr. Stanfield. Awesome. So Dr. Brenner, there's been a lot of excitement both on social media and in published reviews on NAD metabolism, with some papers even mentioning that nutritional activation of NAD metabolism can extend the lifespan of organisms. But after listening to your previous podcast and taking a closer look at the data, it seems that what's actually exciting about NAD is its potential beneficial effects on our body systems when they're under stress, such as conditions like heart failure, so not lifespan extension. Is that correct? Um. It's not exactly the way I'd put it, but I would say that NAD, NAD coenzymes, there's four of them, NAD+, plus, NADH, NADP+, plus, and NADPH, they really are the central catalysts of all of metabolism. And so they're critical in maintaining normal homeostatic processes, um, normal health in every cell and tissue. They become particularly limited by conditions of mod metabolic stress that disturb the NAD system. So we sort of become NAD precursor insufficient in a lot of conditions of, of metabolic stress. And so that's really what, when we do experiments in the laboratory and when I guide clinical groups to do you know, clinical investigations, we like to look at achievable outcomes and uh, basically conditions in which the NAD system is taxed. And, and that is, those are usually the conditions in which NAD precursors are most active. Makes sense. So just for my viewers who might be new to NAD, do we mind just walking it back and saying what actually is NAD metabolism and how does it relate to health? Right. Well, maybe we start with what is metabolism, right? So the, the, to a first approximation, most people think that metabolism is the process by which we convert our food into energy, right? And so, you know, macronutrients are the things that have calories, so proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, and they get broken down in you know, what are called catabolic processes in order to, in part, in order to generate ATP. And ATP is what is used to drive reactions in the cell, to make muscles move, to transmit um, you know, neurotransmitters along axons and, and so forth and so on. And, and when we teach um, biochemistry, there's kind of three to five, you know, really critical weeks of biochemistry that are devoted to how, how is how are how are sugars catabolized, how are fats catabolized, bonus points if people are exposed to how amino acids are are oxidized and how all of this stuff is converted to ATP, and that's really straightforward biochemistry that involves NAD dependent steps. But you wanna know something, Dr. Stanfield and, and all of your viewers and, and listeners, that's about 25% of metabolism is breaking things down. And the other 75% of metabolism is making stuff and maintaining it. Because literally you look at us, every part of our body, unless you have a, you know, Teflon hip or something like that. Every part of your body is biomanufactured by your own cells, right? And so um, we, we eat stuff. And the interesting part of metabolism is when it is partially catabolized, meaning not broken all the way down into carbon dioxide, which is exhaled and ATP or, or heat but partially broken down and then rebuilt up to make all of the stuff that we're made of. So we make all of our RNA and DNA, we make our, our own proteins, 
we make our own lipids, we make our own androgens and estrogens. All of that requires NAD+, plus, NADH, NAP+, plus, NADPH. Um, that, so there's, there's two pairs really of NAD coenzymes, um, NAD+, plus and NADH. And then those have two phosphates on, on, on each of them. And then there's forms of NAD that have three phosphates. They're called NADP plus and NADPH. And NADP plus and NADPH are really critical for making stuff to, to first approximation. And NAD, NADH are really critical for breaking stuff down and generating ATP. And, um, and so these, this is called redox biochemistry. It, it, it's, you know what? It's literally the power lines. It's, so it's literally every cell in our body runs on electron transmission. That's not an analogy. That's an actual fact. And you know what the key electron carrier is? NAD. And the key electron donors are NADH and NADPH. So NAD plus and NADP plus are electron acceptors. They're diffusible, which means they can pick up electrons from one small molecule, and then they can hand off those electrons in another. So famously, you know, animals are fabulous at converting sugar to fat, right? And um, that involves a set of reactions in which the sugar is broken down and basically made into something called citrate. And then the citrate is converted to acetyl-CoA and malonyl-CoA and then palmitate, which is a C16 fatty acid. And then that can be converted to triglyceride and stored, okay? And NAD coenzymes, all four of them are involved in this process. And basically NAD, but the cheat sheet is NAD is picking up electrons from the sugar oxidation and those electrons end up on NADPH, which is used to um, extend and, uh, and uh, reduce the fatty acid chain. And so th this is life. This is how this is how we're living is that we have coenzymes that catalyze all of these reactions that are required for all of our cells and all of our tissues. So that's how central NAD coenzymes are to life is that they're the coenzymatic catalysts for the key biological reactions that allow us to burn fuel and to make ourselves and then to repair ourselves and to keep everything intact and in order. So it require you require an infusion of energy, right? To keep a machine running and to repair that machine. That's how critical NAD is. Awesome, thank you for that detailed explanation. So one of the things that I am definitely hearing from you is that is how central and important NAD and all of the other coenzymes are to yep. our health. So can you just describe to us when some of the situations are that that um, process is under stress where we actually right, need to start right, worrying right, about right, it? Right, right. So, um, so when does the NAD system come under attack? Right. So when you introduced me and you said, this is the person that discovered the nicotinamide riboside kinase pathway to NAD. So that's true. But, you know, the other thing that that I think we're, we're known for is that we developed a technology 
called quantitative targeted NAD metabolomics, where we look at the, the levels of NAD precursors and NAD coenzymes in cells and tissues. And we're finding time and again that conditions of metabolic stress, the NAD system is not stable. It's under attack. And um, so here are some of the conditions in which the NAD system comes under attack. DNA damage, right? So this is an inevitable type of metabolic stress. There are, you know, sunlight leads to, you know, cross-linking pyrimidines when there's two T's in a, in a, in a row um, in a, in a, on a DNA strand and photons are, are added from, from sunlight, you can get a cross-link between the successive T bases, right? That's a type, a very common type of DNA damage. I could name you 12 others. Um, when DNA is damaged, there are enzymes called PARP1 and PARP2 that become activated and they deploy the central catalyst of metabolism, NAD+, not for redox biochemistry to convert fuel into reduced cofactors and ATP, but to polymerize a piece of NAD. So one of the pieces of NAD is called ADP ribose and poly ADP ribose polymerases will make an ADP ribose chain on and around the damaged DNA in order to assemble repair complexes. And so under conditions in which DNA is damaged, cellular metabolism is highly compromised, right? Ever feel wiped out after a sunburn? Um, this is probably some of the reason why is that we've got repair processes going on that are committing cellular NAD to, you know, repair our macromolecules and it's not available for everything else like generating ATP. So DNA repair, reactive oxygen species, detoxification requires NADPH. And so NADPH, which is critical for anabolic processes for making stuff for, you know, making and extending lipids, making uh, testosterone and, and estrogen, um, NADPH is also required to reactivate glutathione, uh, which becomes used in responding to storms of reactive oxygen species. Some of the physiological things that we go through, like uh, time zone disruption when we start getting on airplanes and, 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 and crossing time zone when we have circadian disruption, almost certainly disrupts the NAD system. Overnutrition, when we overfeed mice, we see that their liver NAD system is disturbed. Again, the NADP, NADPH axis is, is depressed. Alcohol metabolism creates a reducing environment. We want our liver to be in an in a oxidizing environment in which fuel can be oxidized. But if we drink a lot of alcohol, then our liver uh, coenzymes are, are kind of NADH rather than NAD plus, and we can't burn fuel very well. Um, and then, you know, many other conditions. So heart failure models in mice show that NAD is under attack. Nicotinamide riboside kinase genes get highly upregulated. So that this is, this is another interesting thing that many of the conditions in which NAD is under attack, the damaged cells are actually calling out for NR. How do we know that? there's a response at the level of DNA, RNA, and protein that when NAD is down, 
many of these conditions at the at the at the level of the nicotinamide riboside kinase genes, the genes get activated, more messenger RNAs get made in order to make more nicotinamide riboside kinase so that if an animal or a human being is lucky enough to being fed NR um, under the conditions of metabolic stress, it can restore, it can replete its NAD levels and deal with these conditions of, of metabolic stress. Um, noise sufficient to induce hearing loss, depresses NAD, there's, there's many such conditions. Awesome, thank you, because I think that's, that's one of the um, key points that I relatively recently um, understood was that it's under conditions of metabolic stress, that's where it looks like if we focus in on the NAD uh, metabolism pathways, that's where we can get some hopefully awesome results. So with right. the yeah, so so with um, clinical studies looking at at conditions of metabolic stress and, and using nicotinamide riboside to hopefully um, Im what improve or stabilize that NAD um, yes. pathway. So w which clinical studies are you most excited about, or, or which ones are in the works? Yeah, um, it's a great question. So you know the what we do is we kind of like scan the the all of biology for um, conditions in which you know one or more tissues could be the liver could be nerves in chemotherapy patients or diabetic neuropathy noise induced hearing loss fatty liver conditions in which the NAD system is under attack and then ideally conditions in which not only are NAD enzymes under attack, but the NR kinase pathway is being upregulated. So that kind of tells us that cells are, are being stressed and they're looking for NR in order to restore their resiliency, right? So, um, and then we want them to be of high public health relevance. So one of the things that we described um, late in 2020 is that coronavirus infection is one such condition. And um, actually a lot of infectious disease uh, responses involve what's called the interferon system in which um, the innate immune system is before it's even generated an antibody, the, the, the innate immune system can recognize that there is a foreign substance that is present and kind of, you know, threatening cell peace, <laughs> for lack of a better word. And um, so uh, double-stranded RNA is not something that mammalian cells make on our own, right? We have we have tRNA, which is a particular shape, and we have messenger RNA, which is a single strand. But viruses, right, like SARS-CoV-2 is what's called a positive strand RNA virus. And, um, but that virus replicates, makes more virus through what are called double-stranded RNA intermediates. So when, when, when SARS-CoV-2, the causative agent of COVID-19, um, enters cells, not cells of the professional immune system, but just sort of nasal epithelial cells, bronchial epithelial cells, um, and those cells detect the double-stranded RNA, those cells get excited and they initiate a series of events that leads to production of beta interferon. Beta interferon is exported from that first responder cell. It binds to an inter interferon receptor in that same cell and the surrounding cells. And that leads to arrow, arrow, arrow activation of a bunch of interferon stimulating, stimulated genes. 
my lab showed uh, last year in collaboration with Tony Fair from uh, University of Kansas and Mike uh, Cohen from Oregon Health Sciences University that five or six genes are induced, well, even more, eight, let's say eight genes are induced that specifically have to do with utilization or synthesis of NAD. Six of those genes basically knock down cellular NAD. So we've shown evidence that coronavirus infection knocks down cellular NAD due to activation of a bunch of PARP related genes. By the way, they have nothing to do with DNA repair. They're not PARP1 or PARP2. They're genes that very few people in the world were focusing on before you know, we saw this. And these are genes that are activated in, in infection. And these genes have activity that is sufficient to knock down cellular NAD. And the NAMPT gene and the NRK genes, which restore cellular NAD, are upregulated. So we think actually that you know, coronavirus infection may be a type of clinical uh, indication that would benefit from higher NAD status. And there are some clinical trials, some that have been completed and that are in the med archives um, as registered and completed clinical trials that use nicotinamide riboside uh, in one notable case in combination with other so-called metabolic uh, cofactors that have had activity um, in reducing, you know, time of hospitalization. So we think that that's a really important thing to, to, to look at whether um, uh, niogen, which is, you know, safe commercialized patented nicotinamide riboside, will have activity in infection prevention and or uh, treatment of uh, coronavirus uh, infection um, by boosting the innate and, and the acquired immune system. We also are very excited about anything involving fatty liver because we know that NR is highly available you know, to the liver and that in animal models that, um, that NR does a remarkable job of reducing steatosis in, in mice fed a uh, high fat diet. And in early phase trials that I think were a little too ambitious, like they were trying to see weight loss and insulin sensitization in 12 weeks without physical activity training, which is, you know, like really shooting for the moon. Um, NR failed to produce weight loss and insulin sensitization in, in you know, that type of trial. But if you look carefully at the data, small n numbers, and not randomized for fatty liver, but you see people with fatty liver um, on NR having a substantial effect size in, in reduction of, of liver fat uh, against placebo. And so we, we really think that NR has a very good chance of being active in fatty liver, which would be phenomenal. And particularly, I think, if it's combined with exercise. So everyone, I believe that increased physical activity should be the standard of care for over, people with overweight and, and obesity, um, and that we should be looking at uh, plus minus NR um, you know, with increased physical activity coaching. And, and there's some trials that, that I'm involved in that are gonna be um, looking, looking at that as, as well. That's all really exciting. And I'm, I'm particularly enthralled uh, because since coronavirus isn't necessarily a big thing in New Zealand at the moment, I'm particularly uh -huh. enthralled with what you've had to say about fatty liver because 
when I was working in the hospitals, I was seeing end stage fatty liver disease where these people were getting massive ascites. So just for my viewers, that's fluid building up yep. in the ab abdomen. And I was having to put drains in these people, draining literally liters of fluid from their abdomen and then infusing them again with um, the protein called albumin. So if we can right. use nicotinamide riboside to, to help with that process, as in to stop that end stage liver disease from occurring, Ideally, that, I mean, that's, I, that's, that's amazing. I, of course, I'd love it if we started earlier, right? Yeah. So, you know, the, 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 the use case of, of, of NIG and of nicotinamide riboside is not necessarily waiting until you're sick. In fact, you know, if I were to show you a bottle, it would say, you know, not intended to treat a disease or condition. It's, it, it's sold as an over-the-counter supplement, right? So we're not actually making health claims here. Um, but... But you know, you think about it, and this is this is the nuance here, which is why this is not a you know two-minute soundbite. I appreciate the fact that this is kind of long-form um, interviewing here. That if you look at the animal indications in which NR has had the most activity, they are conditions of metabolic stress. Like for example, a mouse model of heart failure in which with Matthias Merixay, um, we showed that provision of nicotinamide riboside prevented mice from you know, developing dilated cardiomyopathy and they had a much better ejection fraction and you know, much you know, more normalized fractional shortening than, than uh, the mice that, that, that were not treated with NR that had this genetic precondition to, to heart failure. If you look at the the wild type mouse controls, right? The, the wild type mice that didn't have the genetic predisposition, you know what, they already had a perfect ejection fraction. They already had perfect fractional shortening, you know, for ejection fraction and fractional shortening. They have perfect heart function. So you're not greatly improving the quality of life of the, of the healthy mouse, right? So it's a conundrum because NR, niogen, you know, is available basically to healthy people as a nutritional supplement. So maybe, you, you know, maybe we're, we're noticing, uh, you know, a few things. So we notice that hair and fingernails grow faster. Uh, a lot of people notice that their recovery time in the gym is better. Um, they may feel better. Their coworkers got, you know, flu and cold, and they didn't. They recovered to time zone through time zone disruption a little bit better. But these are not placebo controlled, you know, results. You don't have a control on yourself in the gym, right? You just it's kind of multi anecdotal, right? So we want to design the trials in which NR has the greatest possibility of showing an actual health improvement in a disease or condition, that's going to be really important going forward. But it's also important to remember that disruptions to the NAD system are actually inevitable. Why? Sunlight and oxygen, right? So sunlight damages DNA daily. Oxygen generates reactive oxygen sp species in all cells all the time. When back in the day when I used to speak in crowded auditoria, I would ask for a show of hands and I would say, how many people, you know, would love to jump, jump, jump on a jet, fly to Ibiza, sit out in the sun uh, until a late evening, listening to loud music, eating lots of food and drinking lots of wine, right? And everybody would raise their hand. And I would say, well, every single one of those things that I just mentioned, the sun, the oxygen, the time zone disruption, the food, the loud noise and the alcohol, every single one of those things disrupts your NAD system in one or more tissues, right? So, you know, you know, the niogen is sort of like, it's sort of like preparation or 
you know, maybe, pre you know, prevention and uh, boosting resiliency in healthy people. But, you know, it does have a very, very strong potential, you know, as something that could, you know, boost resiliency against um, infection and disease processes. But, you know, we're not making those claims. We we're very evidence based and we want to see those types of trials. Now, one of the things I didn't say, of course, is I didn't say we're going to do a longevity trial because you really can't. And, 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 and frankly, I, I don't interpret the, the, the most of the animal work as longevity trials. You know, yeah, we could measure the, you know, the lifespan of, of mice with heart failure, but really fundamentally, we mechanistically, we know what it's doing. It's preventing heart failure. So what are we gonna do? Are we gonna start calling, you know, insulin a longevity drug for type one, you know, diabetics? No, it's, a, it, it's insulin replacement for people that can't make their own insulin. So really, I think that there's kind of a pervasive uh, sloppiness in, in a lot of the literature of, 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 of thinking about longevity, I think it's just kind of a non-specific endpoint. And if you understand what's going on in a disease model, then you measure disease, right? And um, so that, I mean, that, and, and then we could also talk about human longevity uh, as well. Yeah, that, I think that absolutely makes sense that it, it's important. And again, that this is only something that I've come, that, that I've actually understood in, in the last few months is that it's, NAD is ex particularly exciting around those diseased states or under metabolic stress. Um, what, one of the things that I wanted to ask though, so the, our cells have got a way, so the salvage pathway, for example, is, is there a, a point where our cells can't keep up and we only need to worry about the NAD metabolism when our cells can't keep up? That, that, that's the thing that I don't quite understand is that we've got this way of recycling NAD. Yep. So at, at, at what point do we actually need to start worrying about the NAD metabolism? Well, you know, worry <laughs> doesn't help us live longer either. But, um, but you know, pre pre prevention, you know, and, and good, good health practices do. So, um, you know, there's a, homeostasis is one of the most important concepts in biology and, and medicine, right? So homeostasis is the set of processes by which we maintain our body temperature, we maintain things to be, you know, we oppose entropy basically, right? And so, you know, one of the first things that I teach, you know, I used to teach undergraduate biochemistry and I, I used to teach, you know, there's only two laws in all of biology or biochemistry, right? The first law is, you know, you can't violate any rules of chemistry and physics. And, and the, second, the second law, I guess I'm gonna call these Brenner's laws. The first law is that you, don't vi you can't violate any rules of chemistry or physics, right? So you can't violate the second law of thermodynamics. And secondly, law of biology is that the things are the way they are because they're encoded, right? They're encoded in DNA and the subject to selective pressure. So the things are the way they are because we've inherited a set of, of rules, you know, from literally from our parents, but also from, you know, billions of years of, of evolution on this planet that have made things a certain way. And, and cellular systems are homeostatic, right? So cellular systems are using input en energy in order to um, try to keep our DNA intact, right? Yet there's sunlight, which is required for growing all the plants on the planet, which are required to make all the food that we eat, whether we're vegetarians or not, because the animals are eating the plants. So the sun is essential for life to generate all the food, right? And so, and we live in the sun and the sun is gonna damage our DNA. So how is life possible, right? And the sun is actually literally gonna damage our DNA in a way 
the challenge is our NAD. So there's got to be a way to replete, to rebuild the NAD system. And there's not just one salvage system, there's kind of three. The, the, maybe the most central one, which is often called the salvage system, is nicotinamide salvage. Why? Because when these PARPs, most of the enzymes, many or most of the enzymes that hack NAD into two pieces, make an ADP ribose piece and a nicotinamide piece. So there's a very critical enzyme called NAMPT that will take that nicotinamide and basically make it back to NMN and then NMN can be converted uh, to, to NAD. So that's, you know, but there are many conditions in which NAMPT expression is depressed, like inflammatory conditions, uh, NAMPT is frequently lower levels. So cells are depending upon other pathways. And then other pathways could be making NAD from tryptophan, the amino acid, but that gets turned off in some systems. Um, making NAD from nicotinic acid, niacin, which can be supplemented, of course. And we don't understand everything about how niacin is made endogenously in cells. And then the final pathway is, is the one that, that our, our group found, which is making NR from, uh, sorry, making NAD from NR. And we're very actively working on where the NR is coming from and what cells are contributing that. But, but you know, if you're taking an, an NR supplement, if you're taking niogen, you know, um, it's largely being used in in tissues in which in which NAD is being churned. So you know, it could be that your liver NAD system is being taxed, or your cochlear NAD system is being taxed if you if you have you know loud uh, noises and many uh, other different systems that will, will take up the NR uh, when their, their NAD is under attack. But, you know, it's not like, I can't really answer it with an age or a BMI or a weight. You know, there are, um, you know, pro football teams that have, you know, 22 year old athletes to 40 year old athletes that are, you know, swear by taking niogen. Um, why? Because, not because of their age or their sun exposure, but because of their workout schedules and, you know, what they're putting their, their, their bodies through. So, you know, I apologize that it's kind of an anecdotal uh, dodge, but I, I think that um, part of the critical homeostatic processes is that our NR kinase genes and other genes involved in rebuilding NAD get upregulated. And so when you're taking NAD precursors, the NAD precursors are utilized in tissues that have a higher NAD demand. And, it, and it's literally dozens of different tissues. Okay, makes sense. Um, I, I, cause this is one of the big learning points that I, I do want to get from you. So um, am I overall correct in saying that um, our body can't, or our cells can't keep up with all of the NAD demands? So that, that there's a lot of different enzymes that, that or, or processes that need NAD as well as the other cofactors. And our cells, cell, well, different salvage pathways can't quite keep up over time. Yeah, but I think... I, I, I largely agree. I, I think that you have to use the word tissue, though, yeah. because it's not I, I don't know what people mean when they talk about, you know, your NAD is declining in, in aging. Um, you know, people are kind of like mixing and matching different results from different systems. 
like you can you can monitor you know a a, a mouse's liver um of course you can't take from the same mouse um a liver multiple times people are sacrificing the mice and taking the liver and analyzing it of my, mice of different different ages um but you know human blood nad doesn't actually change that much as a function of, of age blood is actually not a very old cell type blood is constantly being made um we do know of human populations that have low blood NAD, but they have mitochondrial diseases. And so um, uh, Elia Pirenen and, and our group showed that there are people with a particular mitochondrial DNA mutation that are walking around with low blood NAD. Their mitochondrial disease presents as a muscle myopathy but they have low uh, blood uh, NAD. We think it's much more likely that people with disease and conditions of metabolic stress have a challenged NAD system as a function of infection or as a function of a condition like somebody with heart failure, you know, almost certainly has a challenged cardiac NAD, but their kidney NAD may be fine and their blood NAD may or may not have biomarkers of challenges to their, to their, to their NAD system. So certainly though in infection and in the other types of conditions of metabolic stress, um, there, there are tissues that can't keep up with uh, the churn in the NAD system. And those are the tissues that are probably taking up the most precursors and and they're benefiting the most from from supplementation. Okay, makes sense. Um, your, your point about blood NAD is actually quite topical at the moment because there's a lot of different products that are coming out now that you can measure your NAD levels in your blood at home and you can send them away to get tested. Yes, that they might not be the most accurate, but it's interesting to hear what, what you're saying about how blood NAD, it, it's not necessarily a great marker of your overall um, no, no, I think it's actually kind of dumb. Um, so, um, you know, if I wanted to be selling that, I would have started it, you know, um, something like eight years ago. Um, because, you know, we developed the technology for uh, quantifying the NAD metabolome. We do it routinely on blood. I've measured more NAD metabolomes than than anybody else. I don't consider that to be actionable. Um, everybody, you know, has a blood NAD that is around 20 micromolar if you measure it um, on, the, on the basis of um, whole, whole blood. And then if you take um, a supplement, it could be nicotinic acid, nicotinamide, or NR. Um, few hours later, your blood NAD is going to be higher. Um, you know, does that mean that those three NAD precursors are equivalent? No, it doesn't, because their availability to different tissues is not the same. Um, only uh, cells and tissues that express a gene called NAPERT can use niacin, nicotinic acid, to make NAD. Um, neurons, for example, don't express NAPERT. So um, for neurodegenerative conditions, which are a huge component of human health, um, you know, nicotinic acid is not going to be the precursor of choice. We already discussed that nicotinamide and uh, nicotinamide riboside are converted to NAD through different genes. The NAMPT gene, which is required for conversion of nicotinamide to NAD it is depressed in conditions of metabolic stress. So, you know, there's somebody out there that is, you know, mixing, I don't know, vitamin C and something from green tea with nicotinamide and saying, wow, look at this huge fold change effect in blood NAD. I don't think that that's interesting. You know, any, any, 
form of vitamin B3 will elevate uh, blood NAD in a dose dependent manner. Um, you know, we know Nigen is safe um, at doses up, to, it's been tested up to two grams per day in uh, overweight and obese people. There's multiple trials up to a gram a day in, in multiple human populations. And um, there's, you know, there's essentially no dose limiting toxicity in humans that has really been seen. Um, but I, I don't, I don't really ha ha see a reason why an average consumer needs to measure their blood NAD. To me, it's not, doesn't add any value. It's just, it's a way for people to collect money from them, but um, I don't, I don't see the value of that. So thanks for that insight. So in, in clinical trials, um, is it just important to focus in on the end point as in say with the heart failure or, or cardiomyopathy um, example, is it just important to, to see whether these molecules are working by actually looking at the clinical outcome of whether there's improved ejection fraction and improved cardiac output? Is that how we measure whether these molecules are working or can we use other things to measure the, the NAD metabolism as well? Well, you know, it, it's, it's quite important to know if people have an NAD defect at baseline. So for example, um, there's a study um, that has recently been proposed um, in which there's, you know, an overweight and obese population. And with respect to um, inflammation and exercise, and um, and 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 their health, and we certainly want to see whether people with elevated uh, markers of inflammation have a depressed or different NAD metabolome in an accessible tissue. So it may be that people you know, with, with fatty liver and with organ specific defects in NAD metabolism have some, you know, somewhat disturbed NAD biomarkers and that we'll be able to see that at baseline in particular populations. Um, we don't think that older people as a rule have lower blood NAD, but we, do think that older people have some um, differences in immune cells that if you were to sort the right cells and look at the right biomarkers, you may subtly see some, uh, some different uh, utilization of the NAD system, but that's not something that you, know, you would see just in a blood NAD metabolome. But yeah, of course it's most important to see to 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 look at functionally important outcomes. So, if it's a heart failure trial, you want to look at you know heart function. If it's an anti and inflammation is a huge area for us because in a small uh, clinical study of healthy older men that was done in in Birmingham, the first author was El Hassan, and the last author was Gareth uh, Lavery. Um, uh, we we saw that the 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 older guys they were all all men in the in the study um, had elevated uh, markers of of inflammation IL six IL ten and so forth and just three weeks of of NR you know lowered these markers and so you start um, you know um, getting chronic inflammation under control and you know you potentially improve a, a, a lot of things in in human health potentially, you know, addressing things like long COVID and, and, um, and, you know, the ability to um, enjoy a healthy lifestyle. So you, you've mentioned a couple of times that it's, um, as a general rule, we can't really say that as we age, NAD levels go down. Because um, that, that's something that I've seen both published in the, in the literature and in some marketing materials. Um, and that's something that I've mentioned on my videos as well. So can you just describe um, 
why we can't or, 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 or where the data is at the moment as to does NAD go down as we age? Okay. Yeah. What's um, the accuracy I, I think that you need, I think that you need basically, you know, imaging technologies to look at that because no one is, no one's donating their brain, right? So no one's donating that like we've looked at um, hepatic NAD metabolomes in um, people with alcoholic liver disease. Why? Because, you know, our collaborator, Richard Parker at, you know, in Liverpool had, you know, 40 to 60 biopsies of people that had alcoholic liver disease and was able to get them into his freezer and was able to get them to our lab. And we were able to show that human beings who were alcoholics had depressed NAD in their liver. That's human beings, right? But that, okay, that's a condition of metabolic stress. That's a disease. They had um, alcoholic liver disease and it affected their liver NAD system. But, you know, no one is going around collecting liver biopsies from healthy 20, 40, 60, 80 year old human beings, right? No one is going around collecting, you know, although it's conceivable, you know, skin from, uh, 20, 40, 60, 80 year old human beings. And so how would you even assess what is, what does it mean to say human NAD? It's the sum of all of our organs, most of which are not accessible, right? Most of which, you know, that don't get donated, right? You know, in, for, 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 for this type of, of study. So what people are doing is they're extrapolating from um, animal studies. Um, you know, mice last uh, live two years. Um, mice are actually adults by, you know, 12 weeks or so. So, um, you know, the idea that everything about mice, you know, mice are informative and they help us understand disease models, but they're not, they're not directly informative of, of the human condition. And they're things that can, be, that can be kind of interpreted in different ways if you start thinking about it. So for example, um, you know, our lab's finding very consistently is that conditions of metabolic stress challenge and strongly attack the NAD system, right? Whereas there's other people out there that kind of think that NAD declines chronologically and monotonically, right? Due to some type of a like timer uh, mechanism. I don't know whether that's true. Um, I think it might in fact be episodic due to, <clears throat> you know, episodes of, of metabolic stress. And I'll give you an example of, of, of why I think that and, and, and the type of analysis that you would need to, to use to address this. If you were to take <clears throat> pictures of a cat person, of a person that handles cats, whether they were domestic cats or tigers. If you take pictures of their hands, you could almost certainly order the photographs by the number of scratches in, in the hands, right? But the scratches were not caused by time. The scratches were caused by cats, right? So we might be able to see that there is a correlation in some tissue, like liver is one of the most frequently um, cited tissues in which NAD is reported to decline as a function of time. So greater aging, more months, lower NAD levels, right? And in large part, it's attributed to an enzyme called CD38. But CD38, I want to remind everybody, is activated by inflammatory conditions and infection, right? 
mice are housed, you know, in a non-sterile environment. They're subject to all of the microbiome that is in everybody's mouse facility. And I think you'd have a hard time, you know, distinguishing between the possibility that the older mice had experienced more episodes of, you know, inflammation over time that rather than the days of their lives, those two things are going to correlate. So I'm, you know, in my position and my laboratory thinks that um, until proven otherwise, we think that NAD is really under an active attack. We're not as convinced that it's a time dependent phenomenon. We think that it's sunlight, oxygen, infection, inflammation, loud noises, reactive oxygen species, overnutrition, alcohol, heart failure, neurodegeneration, those types of things that are, you know, attacking the NAD system, which is great for us because we have, can do an experiment in defined amount of time. We can model all of these things. And we see the factors that are being upregulated that are attacking NAD. And then we can come in with NAD precursors and see if it, if it modifies those outcomes. Awesome. Thank you for that insight, because that, that really does sort of help um, firm up my knowledge. So thank you. The, um, the next thing that I wanted to ask if we've got time is uh, we mentioned that, that, that there's different NAD precursors. Um, for some people who say can't afford some of these NAD precursors, so say for example, um, nicotinamide riboside, or, or even if they wanted to consider any men, if they can't afford things like that, what things can they do to help maintain their, their NAD metabolism? Um, well, probably, you know, probably sunscreen and not overeating and over drinking to name three, um, you know, probably avoiding time zone disruption, um, you know, uh, having, you know, good parents probably helps, um, you know, in terms of, uh, genetic, uh, risk factors, but I, I don't, really know what they all are. Um, but um, the thing is that NAD in the wild, NAD precursors come from eating cellular stuff that has NAD in it. So, so here's, here's, here's the thing, is that NAD precursors, which are tryptophan, nicotinic acid, nicotinamide, and nicotinamide riboside, um, these things um, are low, I mean, tryptophan kind of has its own abundance, but the, the, vit the pre NAD precursor vitamins, which are three, nicotinic acid, NR, and nicotinamide, they're not real high abundance compounds. The high abundance compounds in cellular stuff are the four NAD coenzymes. And when we eat um, whole foods, which for the American audience, I always say, is not capitalized because it's the name of a giant grocery store chain. Whole foods, unprocessed foods. When we eat uh, unprocessed foods, the NAD coenzymes are broken down into vitamins. And then the vitamins go into cells and are rebuilt into, into NAD. So by eating a, you know, a, a, a diet that is rich in you know, relatively unprocessed foods, you're going to be getting some NAD precursors, right? And, and so you're like an animal, you know, in, in its natural environment, or you're like a person prior to 1938, when Conrad Elvihem discovered nicotinamide and nicotinic acid as NAD precursor vitamins. The people that were getting pellagra had the worst diets, right? They had diets that were largely um, uh, lard and cornmeal or something. And, um, and the way that the corn was being processed, you know, 
in the American South as opposed to by uh, Native Americans didn't uh, make NAD precursors bioavailable. So they, they really had an NAD deficiency. Now, whether an unsupplemented diet gives you the full resiliency that you would have uh, with some supplementation, I don't know. I think that people probably are healthier um, since niacin enrichment of foods uh, I think that that's actually been a good thing. Um, and I think, as I said earlier, I think that there is a use case for, um, for NR uh, supplementation. Awesome. Thank you. Because, so I'm just trying to um, personalize this to me. So I'm 29 and I take niacin, it's about 50 milligrams or 100 milligrams. Um, but it's interesting to hear what you've got to say about how not all of these um, precursors will actually be used to, to remake or, or rebuild NAD in the different tissues. So right. for, for someone who's, say, for example, like me, who's otherwise healthy, um, do you think that that we would get much benefit as, you know, sort of a late 20s, early 30s, otherwise healthy person? Should we be supplementing with these molecules if we're already getting some in our diet? Or is it only when we're actually experiencing metabolic stress, so time zone disruption or, you know, things like that? Um, I, I, you know, I think that it's worth the experiment. You know, I think that people that that that, that try, you know, Nigen might want to keep a journal and kind of um, think about what their current health status is and, you know, introduce it and, you know, see if they can um, see a benefit, you know, you know, in the gym or through a period in which, you know, coworkers are, you know, getting, getting, you know, colds and infections and being, being knocked down by things, you know, it, it's hard. I want to be evidence-based, so I can't, you know, guarantee, you know, results. I think that the, the most common report that, that, really just about everyone experiences is um, faster hair and nail growth um, on, on, on NR, but that, you know, that's not exactly a health complaint, right? That's an observation of seeing a, um, an anabolic effect actually of NR is one of the, one of the most um, striking things. Um, it would, it'd be actually would be interesting um, to do a placebo controlled trial, you know, focused on anabolic, you know, results like, you know, weight training, whether people, you know, can increase their, their muscle mass or their lean muscle mass. Um, if they're, but, you know, it has to be, everybody has to be exercising, right. In order, in order to, to have, have the effect. But, um, you know, I, I don't I don't think that there is a minimum or maximum age, because I think that we're all you know in the sunlight and in oxygen and we all you know experience conditions of metabolic stress every day, so you know I think it has potential to uh, to benefit people that that are healthy. Thank you for your insights. This has been a pretty awesome podcast and I'm sure the audience will absolutely love it as well. So thank you very much. Hopefully we can have you um, back on the channel to go into a lot more detail about other great, things that great. I want to ask you about. So thanks very much. Thanks.